good afternoon everyone. Um, my association with IIT Madras incubation cell goes a long way. I think it's been seven years. And I think I met Jaya about four years back. <laughs> and uh, Gopal sir uh, some time back. Uh, but uh, it's always interesting to share uh, experiences, uh, leverage uh, what we are learning on the market. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, this is part of our duty to all the startups, right? So, with that background, let me give a quick introduction about uh, myself and Bond as a company. In addition to what Gopal said, uh, I've been involved uh, in the ID landscape for the last 20 years. Um, I uh, passed out from Bits Planning, uh, worked in life sciences industry for some time in sales and marketing, and then. Uh, moved on to do my MBA and then uh, built a startup on IT product and services uh, to a good valuation. Uh, then moved back to enterprise IT in the US. Then moved back from the US to build Bond. This is about uh, eight years back uh, when uh, people were not talking about digital. Uh, and. Uh, we wanted to create a firm that sits in the intersection of uh, marketing and technology. And the idea was, uh, we felt that uh, IT was already taken, DPO was already taken, uh, marketing was one field that was not commoditized. So we felt that we could make a mark in marketing. So the vision for us was uh, to create a firm that sits between art and science, uh, which is marketing, branding, and then uh, science, which is how we kind of take that forward. Fast forward now, eight years later, we are now the largest, world's largest privately held digital agency. We work with over 450 brands now, uh, the leading names in retail, fashion, luxury, uh, you name it now. In fact, interestingly, and Bhopal was mentioning, I had a deja vu when we started, uh, we pretty much worked with all the leading fashion, lifestyle, retail names like Ferragamo, TKNY, Donna Karen, Red Bull, uh, Tag Heuer, Mont uh, Blanc, uh, Cartier and the likes. But now, 60% of my revenue comes from B2B, which is uh, discrete manufacturing and uh, chemical, automotive and things like that. So I do, uh, we do see a shift. Um, in terms of B2C and B2B, B2C I think is in phase 3 of digital evolution. B2B is getting into phase 0 and phase 1. I think it's an interesting phase. And why born? You will see our logo cut. The reason is uh, it's self explanatory in the session because you can never claim that you know everything in digital. You are always learning every day and you are always born and you always give birth to brands and you're engaged in digital. That's the essence of the name born. Now, what I want to cover today was a um, couple of things, right? A lot of times, um, and I'll cover with a provocative statement that um, uh, today 84% of the digital transformation projects fail, right? That's a recorded statistic. 84% of digital projects fail uh, because everybody thinks that digital is a division. You create a chief digital officer, you know, you put a guy on it, you create a digital budget, and you think that okay, things will happen. But actually, uh, digital is an operating model. It's a journey, and it's now in the corporate boardroom. And uh, what I so the way I wanted to cover digital marketing was. Start from the startup business idea to digital to digital marketing, rather than digital marketing, uh, you know, uh, being a separate activity. You're getting what I'm trying to say, right? So it's a it's a different uh, way of looking at things because when you look at digital marketing, we always question the fundamentals of the business because it's not about uh, doing SEO or SEM or email campaign, but it's about what what is the USP and UBP, right? You know, what is the value that, why customers want to choose your brand? 
So it starts with customer experience to what is the story that you are telling and the only channel, which is where, which of the channels are you aligned to and how does it converge into sales, right? So we'll cover that part of it. And I must say that um, we are very proud because we started our journey by saying customer experience. Two months back, Bill McDermott, who is the CEO for uh, SAP, the largest software company in the world, he came on stage and he said, customer experience is everything. <laughs> Whereas eight years back, our deck started with customer experience, storytelling, you know, how you want to kind of bring the brand. And I would, if there are three, four takeaways that I would want today, I think there are only two takeaways that I want you to have it in your head. Customer experience and storytelling. Customer experience, storytelling. Customer experience, storytelling, right? What is the story you want to tell about your brand? What is the customer? What experience you want your customers to have? If you nail these two, I think there is all our tactics that we kind of undergo, you know, along the process, right? So, this is just a snapshot, I think I've covered it. Uh, this is about non. Um, yeah. So we always say that it's, it's about the intersection of art and science. So, um, quick provocative question to all of you. As a startup CEO or a startup founder or somebody who's uh, looking at... Uh, uh, so, uh, thank you for the, the elaborate introductions. I think uh, I must thank Jaya and Gopal sir for, uh, for a very diverse uh, group here. So I'll tweak my um, talk track a little bit. I think um, some of you would be at uh, point A, who are, you know, wanting to go to point B. Some of you would want to come to point A, and some of you would want to go from point B to point C. And uh, I think uh, more than this talk track, I think we'll also, I'll, I've also created something called a workshop kit for startups and digital marketing, which we will kind of work through. So today, uh, today's presentation, I wanted to present three things. One is, uh, uh, for people who are at point, going from point B to point C, you might feel some repetition. I wanted to make sure that we get everybody on the same context. So we kind of do zero to point A, which is what is digital, what is digital marketing for starters. And then we kind of move into certain examples because uh, I think uh, Gopal sir was very specific that we got to do some Indian examples because um, global examples might not be fully relevant here. And uh, then we, I'll, I have some videos that I wanted to show in terms of omni-channel and, and what about it. So that's kind of broadly I wanted to cover. So um, for a lot of startup. Uh, CEOs and founders, I think um, the broad question is what keeps you awake at night, right? You know, uh, everybody will, will say, I want revenue, I want, uh, you know, more downloads of the app. I think five years back, if you asked the Mentra CEO, you would have said, I want better downloads of the app. Um, somebody would have said, I want more <coughs> social media followers. Um, and somebody would have said, I want better website metrics, which is I want more traffic to the website, I want more, uh, I want to pay more money to pay the campaign and get the traffic, and then it will automatically follow, right? Don't worry about it, right? So everybody wants to achieve that uh, growth, and um, how do you kind of like, you know, what type of challenges that uh, we are looking at to achieve that type of growth, right? And interestingly, in our experience, um, everybody wants sales growth rather than uh, anything else, right? Because they all want mostest for the leastest, right? You know? uh, and and uh, I must say that um, I don't know whether uh, 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 you guys have tracked Nike. Nike social media has got about 25 million unique followers. This was about four years back. And uh, for them to build 25 million unique followers, they had to kind of put not most us for the least us, but they had to put in energy and money regularly. And what it gave for them was if they had to launch an Air Max shoe, 
for $175, they could get an instant reaction back in terms of whether it's accepted or not accepted at a prototype level. It's big for a company like Nike. At a prototype level, I want to show whether people are going to take or not. Right? The same is true for Nissan, which runs a command center out of Chennai, uh, which has a lot of people who are running the social media command center. And globally, they are managing the entire social media sentiment. Right? So the one thing that uh, we have observed is um, shortcut to digital marketing will not work. What we mean by shortcut is you might have had a bad experience with a vendor or you might have had a bad experience yourself or you might have, uh, uh, you don't have the budget to invest on it, but it's a journey and we are easily looking at a five year journey at least to get you to a decent state. Right? You are not, you are not good right? And what do your followers talk about? We'll come back to it in a minute in terms of we have prepared something called an experience wheel for uh, digital transformation. We'll come back to it on a quadrant called React. But earned media is so uh, pivotal today that um, I can only relate some personal experiences. Um, we were in, uh, in uh, Indonesia in uh, Shangri-La last month and uh, the customer service was very poor right? and uh, within uh, seconds I just put it on the trip advisor I said it's very bad, you know, it's like one on five and I'm an inner circle member, this is not the treatment that we need. Right? Within five minutes, the entire team came running and they said, no, we are really sorry, we just saw that. So the, the, the earned media is so powerful today that you can actually see customers actually flooding both positive and negative reactions at the same time. So an investment in the react portion, how does your customer react, right? And what do they feel about it is, is an investment that a lot of brands overlook, right? And that's something that I'll give you a lot more examples as we talk through. But I think this, this is an initial, um, um, you know, pivot that we had all the time when we worked with a lot of brands, both US, UK, and India, and Asia, where when they engage bond, they say, hey, I want growth in sales. I want 2x growth in sales. Yeah, great. What does your brand stand for? Can it really grow? Right? Can it grow? I mean, I don't understand. What do you mean by 2x growth in sales? So I was speaking with, uh, I'm sorry about using all these examples because I just wanted to be more practical <laughs> than uh, than a lot of theory, but we were speaking yesterday with a brand in the Middle East. I was speaking with the CFO and the CEO, biggest brand in the Middle East, retail brand in the Middle East, right? And uh, they're doing quite well in the in the digital channel, but they felt that they have invested in a wrong partner, and the website is not performing well. When I say website, it's an e-commerce site is not performing well and uh, scalability is not there, performance is not there, digital marketing is not existent because traffic is not there. So hey Bon, can you be the silver bullet, can you just, uh, you know, get me 2x sales and can you uh, give me a better website, better navigation, better customer experience, these are all the buzzwords today, right? hey, give me all these things and I'll pay you little. Right? I said, uh, I mean, I was speaking with the board and the CEO and the CFO. I asked a very simple question to them. I said, uh, I think we are in the wrong room, first, first and foremost. Right? First and foremost, I don't understand your business objectives. When I ask your business objectives, you are saying my site performance is bad, my site is not scalable, my navigation is not good, I want to achieve sales. But these are not business objectives. Right? These are very practical statements that I'm here. What are your business objectives? How much, what is your offline sales today? Right? What percentage of offline sales do you want to take it online? And in what period do you want to take it? And how do you want to take it from a traffic? What is your traffic today that comes to the store? 
do you incentivize the store people to have a metric to take it to online sales? Do you incentivize the online uh, digital officer to have a metric to take it to offline sales? What is the algorithm for? Just to kind of explain this a little bit more deeper, uh, we did some massive multi-million dollar e-commerce sites in India. Data Click, Shopper Stop, you name it, right? All these are multi-million dollar e-commerce sites done by us. When we do that, we created this functionality called Assisted Selling Module, right? Which is nothing but you go to a uh, retail store, an arrow store, and you want to buy a Battery. You want a battery? Battery type. Okay. That's okay. You want to buy a, or is it uh, audible? So, you can't record it. Oh, you can't record it. So, so you buy a, uh, not buy, you go to Arrow store in, um, say, uh, uh, Phoenix Mall. Uh, you, you want to buy a white linen browser, which is Put that you're looking at a size 32. The guy says, I, I don't have the size 32. Okay, great. Let's go. Uh, the, the store guy will say, uh, I don't have it here, and he will just be very cool about it. Right? But the e commerce site has got an option where it can find size 32 in the nearby store, and you can actually order that through the store. That's called omni-channel. Through the store, the e-commerce site has that functionality. But why does the store associate not tell that? Because he doesn't care. He's not, like Goldratt says, right? You tell me how you will measure me, I'll tell you how I'll behave. Right? So he's not measuring, he his metrics does not have the concept of online orders. So in a retail environment, if you don't have online offline combination in an omni channel world, it's a problem. No? So, even digital marketing, your investment in digital marketing is 100% affecting your offline world. If anybody says it's not affecting my offline world, they're tru truly mistaken. It's 100% affecting your offline world. Right? But the key is how do you iterate the metrics? as you move along the ladder. And there are enough tools that will give you enough data about how do you kind of iterate the metrics, how do you go along the ladder, the ladder and things like that. But you get the drift, right? It's, it's all about how do you kind of combine um, these two elements. This is an interesting video that I thought um, I should put it because this is something that we kind of do in most of the startup camps. Um, and again, this is not to provoke you guys, but it's uh, being a startup man myself. I have um, I have a lot of uh, tales to talk about it, right? So why well, it's not playing? Quite fast because 
you know we the the value and the fit analysis is quite like uh, immediate right so cutting the chase um you know we we have i think this i'm sure uh, jaya and gopal sir would have iterated i think like a lot of startups um when they get into digital marketing they actually blame the digital marketing side of things and i have seen it personally but actually it's not about the digital or digital marketing it's about the brand itself right it's about the brand right? it's not that, okay you know i've spent like $1000 every month with the digital marketing team and things are not happening oh okay great but let let's do an introspection right you know why it's not happening why don't people come to your site or come to your web presence and not do anything right so it could be many reasons i mean i we don't want to go that right but i think we found that 72% of the startups fail to deliver the customer experience this is what i broadly i wanted to create a take away today which is i think you guys latched on from what i told earlier which is customer experience storytelling on the channel customer experience storytelling on the channel you got to always keep that in your mind and see how what difference are you making every day to it right customer experience on the channel story so before i i think i'm using a lot of it i'll cover up front because i won't try to cover through slides right um omni channel um i'm sure some of you know it some of you don't know it but i'll try to kind of get everybody on the same page right um very years back when you wanted to buy a watch or we find rolex and i want to sell this watch very years back how will you sell it? Can anybody tell? Huh? Brand ambassador. Twenty years back, I said. Twenty years back. So you put a TV ad, you put a uh, newspaper ad, Rolex. Yeah, you put a. Huh? Yeah, whatever. I'm just saying advertisement. It could be TV, radio, newspaper, whatever. Broadly, I'm saying we don't want the accuracy. Uh, so advertisement is one option. Um, somebody told brand ambassador that could be one option. Like it could be uh, popular personalities endorsing the product. What are the options? Sponsor, sports, direct, direct selling. Direct selling. So that's the channel. Billboard could be an option. Right, I see the billboard. Uh, print. Nobody said print because twenty, thirty years back, print was big. Right, printed magazines, printed brochures, printed catalogs, printed whatever print. Right. So we call that print as a channel. Um, advertising is a channel. Billboard is a channel. And uh, maybe you have uh, one or two more channels extra, like door to door selling and things like that. so okay broadly you have five channels so if i'm the marketing head or if i'm the ceo of rolex I, my job is cut out because i have a 100 million dollar budget i'll say i'll allocate 60 million dollars to tv i'll allocate something else somewhere and this thing, right today the channels have proliferated today if you want to sell rolex for you Facebook, like not just media. Facebook. Media. Yeah, there are in social media alone there are about 48 channels. Facebook, Instagram, what channel you want to play in social media? Yeah. So web website, mobile app, uh, you know social media, kiosk, gaming, IoT. You know what have you? There are multiple channels. Said plus, you have to add the traditional channels because you can't ignore the traditional. Because there will be, there will be this uh, segment who will want to buy that through the traditional channels, or there will be a segment which will. Even the millennials today surf online and buy the traditional channel, right? So that will happen too, right? Well, today. is much more complex so the cmos are scratching their head you know what do i do man i mean it's like i get 100 million dollars why do i put it in right i i'm like i can put something in social i can put something in tv and 
you know, it's kind of getting crazy. And I think you guys would have read the news last year. The spend on digital exceeded the spend on TV. It's a big deal for the world globally. The spend on uh, digital exceeded the spend on TV in terms of advertising and this thing. I, I mean, we can get the real numbers, but I'm saying it's a big deal. So the, the problem we have is how do you then create a consistent customer experience? So you can't create a customer experience at a digital level. So I think uh, um, let's take B2B example, right? Uh, if I'm running automotive shop, right? or if I'm running, uh, let's take uh, we, we did a digital campaign for a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning company. Right? It's as B2B as it can be, right? They produce bespoke custom built refrigeration units. Right? What is digital for that? Can somebody tell me? What is digital marketing and digital transformation? This is a company that sells, say this is a room, I'm Costco, I have this room. I want to create a uh, what do you call it? Power shape refrigerator. It's custom built. The company produces only custom built refrigerators. Obviously, to stock poultry or whatever, right? Dairy or any anything. Right? So, what is digital for them? The target segments are not the end customers. The target segments are dealers, distributors, or uh, any uh, SME manufacturers or whatever, right? So when you do digital marketing for them, what digital marketing will you do for them? LinkedIn. Huh? LinkedIn will be one of the LinkedIn is a channel. Yeah. Right. But the primary mode still would be their website. Right? Their website. Their parent website. Because that's where dealers will have their login. Right? Today if you look at B2B marketing, then it works on a parent of principle. 80, uh, 20 percent of the dealers get 80 percent of the revenue. So a lot of brands would like to incentivize that top dealer with custom promotions, right? So it is all done manually today, right? There will be some backend ERP system. They will try to reconcile on paper or some old system, and they will know okay, this dealer at the end of this month has done a lot of sales and do it. But actually, that's not the real issue. The real issue in digital marketing is what is your business business problem today manually, and what is the business problem as you go digital? Right. The business problem for them was why I'm spending some time to take this is because when you do digital marketing, you have to look at what is the business problem you have for your customers. Right. So when we did the value map. The business problem that they had was when a dealer comes to this company and says, I need a coat for a refrigerator of this size, the dealer will go to this company, who is my customer. And this company will look at 600 parameters. What are the parameters? Heating, lighting, ventilation, ergonomics, you know, the whole nine yards of the room condition. Box load, whether it should be a square uh, refrigerator, what is the units, thermal units, everything they calculate in the back end and then they give the code. Can anybody guess how long the code used to take in terms of time? 10 days. 10 days? We are talking about this size, you know, this thing, very sophisticated company in the US. They have patents on refrigeration systems, right? It used to take three and a half months for a dealer to give a custom built coat because they have some 20 legacy systems which are not digitized and you have to look at each and every system in that 600 parameters, 20 parameters will be in one system, 30 parameters will be in another system. 40 parameters will be other system. So how much ever efficient you work, you are actually kind of like taking that amount of time. It used to be okay in the older days, but today it is not okay because the guy will lose his customer. Right? So that dealer will 
ask my customer and then he will go to carrier, which is a competitor of my customer, right? And he will say, okay, if carrier can give in one day, yeah, why not? So your KPI immediately becomes what? Lead to quote, order to fulfillment, order to remittance. Your KPI is not sales, it's different, right? So what is your business problem and what is your KPI? That is what we need to do in your workshop, right? Your, your KPI need not be sales. Sales is an outcome, right? But KPI would be an ancillary factor to the, sorry, the, the KPI will be a direct factor to the, you know, outcome. So when you do that, what is digital marketing here? Digital marketing is, can I create a simplistic interface which takes not 600 parameters, but 60 parameters and give a quote. That's the first step. So we did that, which means you will get a quote in not four months, you will get a quote in one minute. You get the revolutionary approach that digital has taken. Instead of three and a half months, it gives today at one minute. One minute. Then comes digital marketing. Now I have this portal. Now I smash the portal to entire dealers in that ecosystem. Now, right? Then comes your whole thing about how do I build traffic, how do I build loyalty, how do I kind of have them uh, do it. But in the absence of this portal, what is digital marketing? Can somebody tell me? It's nothing, right? You will just spend money for, for gaining what? Right? The same dealer will go to another company which is giving a better lead to quote. Are, are you guys with me so far? Am I? Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so that's one of the examples that uh, I wanted to bring up. So it's basically value map and the customer profile. Right? I'm sure you would have rehashed this again and again and again. So please treat me as another reiteration. <laughs> So, um, so this is something that I found it pretty good, which we normally use with the customers. And nothing is just a rehash of it's a reiteration of you know what is your what is the pain point that the customer has, what does the customer gain, and what are the tasks that the customer um, you know jobs we call it jobs. So you iterate, the, you keep on iterating. This is a framework. Now why am I talking this in digital marketing? This framework is the input for your digital marketing strategy because without this, it's very tough for you to create your KPI. And without KPI, it's very tough to be successful in the digital, digital and digital marketing footprint. Right? So I have a short video on this. This is created by Strategizer. Again, this is all one of the, uh, I mean, one of the big firms globally. Uh, I mean, uh, I would recommend uh, Jaya to take a look at it. I think Jaya and Gopal sir. Uh, this is, uh, again, not unique, but one of the companies. So I have a small video on this, which will be helpful. It's a two-minute video. Yeah. Every day, companies design products and services to improve their customers' lives. But 72% of new product and service innovations fail to deliver on expectations. This means that customers don't care about 7 out of 10 new products introduced to the market. It doesn't have to be this way. Just like you create value for your business with a business model canvas, there is in fact a tool to intentionally visualize, design and test how you create value for customers. It's called the Value Proposition Canvas. The Value Proposition Canvas is composed of two parts, the Customer Profile and the Value Map. With the Customer Profile, you describe the jobs your customers try to get done. Jobs can be functional, like getting from A to B, social, like impressing friends and colleagues, or emotional, like gaining peace of mind. You highlight your customers' pains, which annoy customers while trying to get a job done. Pains are negative outcomes that customers hope to avoid, like dissatisfactions with existing solutions and challenges, frustrations, risks or obstacles related to performing a job. And you outline customer gains which describe how customers measure the success of a job well done. 
gains are positive outcomes that customers hope to achieve, like concrete results, benefits and even aspirations. Use the customer profile to visualise, test and track your understanding of the people or companies you intend to create value for. It's a map that becomes clearer the more you learn about your customers. The second part of the canvas is the value map. With it, you list the products and services your value proposition builds on. You describe in which way these products, services and features are pain relievers, how they eliminate, reduce or minimise pains customers care about, making their life easier. And you outline in which way they are game creators, how they produce, increase or maximise outcomes and benefits that your customers expect, desire or would be surprised by. The value map makes explicit how your products and services relieve pains and create gains. Use it to design, test and iterate your value proposition until you figure out what resonates with customers. You achieve fit by creating a clear connection between what matters to customers and how your products, services and features ease pains and create gains. Great value propositions target essential customer jobs, pains and gains and do so extremely well. Your customer profile may contain countless jobs, pains and gains, but your value map highlights which ones you intend to focus on. But don't forget, an outstanding value proposition can still fail if your business model is flawed. Successful companies embed outstanding value propositions in scalable and profitable business models. Use the value proposition canvas to create products and services that customers want. Okay, so I think that broadly kind of builds a View. I'll explain this uh, with an example. Uh, again, you would have seen the flow of our our work, our presentation to be more relational. But I'll explain this with an example, which is uh, we were working with this brand called Lorna Jane in Australia, and uh, Lorna Jane is one of the startup companies uh, some time back. But today they are not a startup. Uh, they were producing nothing but women's uh, activewear. Women's activewear is nothing but uh, you know tight yoga pants for women, uh, tops as well as bottoms. Right? Simple product competing with Lululemon, which is like the world leader in yoga pants, Under Armour, and the, and the likes. Nike. It's a big market. Women's activewear is a very big market, and. Uh, they, uh, they price their product at about 140 Australian dollars, which is quite, quite significant, right? uh, quite big. And uh, what is digital marketing for them? Right? You know, when they came to us four or four and a half years back, uh, we, we did not do exactly the same thing, but we did a value map. Right? What is, you know, what, why people should, why women should wear buy a $140, uh, you know, you tight pants to exercise. Then we went back to the drawing board and we looked at three things, right? So one is customer experience and storytelling. What story you would want to tell on the brand? Right? So the storytelling we conceptualized along with this value map that you see as beautiful video, the storytelling we conceptualized was you can't go online by showing a product that is yoga pants at $140, just like that. You have to tell a concept. What is a concept? It's basically fit, foot, yoga, and something like that. So you can you can check out Lorna Jane's site, right? I, I, I'm dating back, right? Four years back. So it's lornajane.com.au. So you will see the focus was not on the product, the focus was on the story, right? The story is, as women, how do you need to be fit? So the first pivot there is food. The second pivot is healthy living. Sorry, the first pivot was healthy living. For healthy living, you need to be fit, you need to have the right food, and you need to have the right clothes, right? So it's, it neatly fits into a canvas of storytelling. You know what is the value of the brand today? reaching about 500 million dollars. Right. The power of storytelling, how do you do it? Right. And we scale that uh, whole digital presence from just Australia 
to, uh, I mean, we are not taking credit for that. I mean, what I'm trying to say is it's, it's, a, con it's a collaborative effort in terms of how do you want to combine storytelling, the brand, and how do you want to be. Can you give a couple of examples of storytelling in a B2B situation? Yes. So, um, storytelling in a B2B situation would be, um, let's take, uh, we are working with uh, PT Astra, right, which is one of the largest conglomerate in, uh, in the nation. They make about 40 million dollars. They are similar to Tata. They are in automotive, real estate, uh, hospitality, minerals, industry, manufacturing, you know, every, every segment. So when they want to do digital, right, the first thing that we came back to them was you know, what type of uh, story, what type of customer experience we want to give us. So, in a B2B context, the storytelling is layered between KPIs and customer experience. So, we went back to the KPI on the refrigeration uh, argument, right? Sorry, refri refrigeration case study. The, so, it's the same as what is the customer experience and what is the KPI you want to give. So, let's take first automobile as a division, which is the best performing division is the 40 billion dollar. So 15 billion dollars comes from automobile. So what is the storytelling you want to tell for a company that's franchising all brands of the company? Right, so there's no uniqueness of Astra, right? I'm franchising BMW, I'm franchising Nissan, I'm franchising Toyota. So then we said, okay, park that for a moment. What is the KPI that we are the KPI we are looking at is fairly similar to the same concepts that we told, which is broadly you will have about 20 KPIs which will fit in the B2B space, which is order to remittance, order to fulfillment, lead to code. It's all about enhancing your dealer customer experience. Your pivot on customer changes from end consumers to dealers and OEMs and uh, you know the stakeholders in that ecosystem. So a lot of times these companies don't even cater to the stakeholders because they think that the state they take them for granted, right? So the storytelling there was, for me, I have, there are 10 dealers in Indonesia who give me 90% of my sales, but I just don't even speak with them. I just don't even cater to them, right? So my storytelling very clearly was, if I am creating a digital asset, I need to make sure that I pamper my top selling deals. That's the first story I am giving, right? Because I just want, because it goes back to the KPI. How do you want to align your story to the KPI that you would want to give, right? The second story that I wanted to tell was, next comes the OEM guys, right? How do I pamper my OEM guys? So there is sales by dealers, then there is sales by OEM guys. So if Toyota is performing well for me, what type of uh, storytelling I want to give to Toyota to invest more in the region? So there are different methods that we came up with that, you know, um, uh, Indonesia could be the hub for them to kind of create some safety uh, tools which could be plugged directly in Indonesia because we had a good market share there. So it goes into how, how can PT Astra pivot Toyota in Southeast Asia? So that type of storytelling we try to incorporate into the uh, website, right? Into, you know, uh, launching the website. Then there was another concept of the standard KPI which is lead to code, right? Again, the dealers had an issue because they had no visibility on inventory and uh, they had to wait for uh, the quotation to come in and, and people to, you know, take that forward, right? So lead to code was an improvement. Then the fourth storytelling was um, uh, was about uh, used cars. So they never had any mechanism like India or US, where like India, I think Mahindra is specialized on used cars, right? But in, in Indonesia, there was no mechanism on used car standardization, right? So how can PT Astra take that story of a one-stop shop, you know, fits all. Now I told you the tactical pillars. Now how does it convert into one? The story was, can I create an interconnected customer for life? That is the story. 
So if I have to create an interconnected customer for life, now what do I do? It's not just not a model. So I'll have a uh, customer who has bought a Toyota car. The same customer would be looking at a house later on. So I have the customer database. I can, as far as go to real estate division. So I can interconnect it with the promotional offer of buying these two. So how do you create an interconnected customer for life? This was the key concept story that, that was created. And then your digital assets proliferated around that uh, story because you had that scale. But when you don't have that scale, then the storytelling becomes completely different. Right? You know, because we want to kind of add that as you move on, right? How do you build that as you uh, move on and, and take it up to the next step? So there are some examples, right? In, um, in the case of, uh, so there's one example that we we, uh, we did uh, as a storytelling for a UK-based company, which is a, not a big company. It's called HSS Hire. Uh, they were into uh, produce, they were into the business of uh, giving uh, tools for hiring. Right? You can in the UK you can hire a driller for one day. You can hire a driller for one hour. You can hire a driller for or a crane for like ten days. That was the business that they were in. They were called HSS Hire uh, as a business. Right? Very interesting business. Some time back they were very small, but today they are very big. So what is the storytelling that you could give for a higher business? Right? The storytelling that we wanted to give for the higher business was, obviously with collaboration with them was, when you buy a driller, you need training on how to use a driller because pretty much all developed uh, countries use divide, do-it-yourself concept. Right? So how do you combine that training component? So it's a lot more, the storytelling revolves around cross-selling. How do I create the cross-selling mechanism and bring it in a customer experience pivot? And that is the true, uh, uh, you know, value that uh, the storytelling brings. Uh, to Does that? Is there a checklist you can share? Um, Frank, yeah, we can create a checklist, but the thing is, the checklist changes by the business. But we can create a checklist. No, right? We can. Good create a generic checklist, but it uh, totally changes by the type of business that we are in. Like today I saw some businesses which are catering to the solar, uh, you know, type of panels, right? So the checklist there could vary after like 10 points, right? So we uh, we can create one generic checklist. From there, they need to customize, actually. We can create one. That's not Yeah. Between a uh, written copy and a video, oh. which is the you know, video experience, yes. which is the best of the mind. Yes. Mind. So you can talk about the, 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 the concept of underwater sea uh, thing without explaining, right? You can just show a three minute video or a two minute video, what is it all about? In a very sophisticated manner, right? So videos actually convey in a much, much better way and actually it's a very low hanging fruit because the cost to produce is very uh, less. But here is the challenge, a badly produced video is a problem. <laughs> Because uh, videos, 
unlike image, right? If you take a photograph, right? Unlike imagery um, is uh, very challenging because you are crystallizing a complex concept into a very simple concept. And we all like complexity. <laughs> we like to, I mean, when you, when uh, a lot of people try to uh, describe something, we like to put it in a complex way. But videos have to uh, crystallize into a very simple way. So videos are tough, but uh, my our recommendation is videos. And you should always go for video. Yeah. Uh, story. So how do you gauge that's the story that people want to hear? Excellent question. I was waiting for this question. Right? Excellent. So storytelling, um, uh, actually, as I said, as you saw in the earlier video, the storytelling uh, is be is best evaluated by the market. Is best evaluated. So you create a story. For example, I'll take an example. IIT Madras Incubation Center. What is the story? We incubate startups, we mentor and coach startups. Okay, you put it in the world wide web, and uh, if Gopal sir is talking with somebody in Harvard, right, and he says, okay, here is a link to what we do, and they look at it, and if they have got a different view of your story, that means you have failed in your story. So you can actually figure it out quite easily, right? It's 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 quite instantaneous on your story, right? You know. What are you trying to say, right? Or you can you can ask hundred. Uh, you can do A/B testing. There are multiple tools, right? You can do A/B testing. You can actually get hundred prospective customers to take a look at it and do it. So we do all those things. Like in the case of Astra, we got hundred prospective dealers to take a look at the story and comment about it, right? So you you do that. Actually. Yeah. Just on that that note, so for example, the uh, brand like Nike, right? So uh, they don't uh, when they come up with the uh, shoes. They don't, they don't say that it's a good shoe, it's a best shoe. They come with the story of a, a guy, uh, like a black person or someone, who is uh, wearing that, you know, uh, toiling around and then still showing the shoes. So is it okay to, to give different story to different uh, category of people? Uh, uh, and I'll be controversial here. Yeah. It's perfectly okay to give any type of story that fits. Any type of story that fits. In fact, yesterday we met a guy uh, in the U.S., I mean, we spoke with a guy in the U.S. who calls himself as anti-brand. Anti <coughs> I don't name him. Uh, he says anti-brand. The name of the <laughs> brand that he says is anti-brand, right? So it's just controversial, right? It's, it's just how do you want to kind of, uh, you know, pick it up. And also, I want to clarify, right? Uh, we are seeing the patterns, broad patterns here, right? B to C, B to B, right? It's not B to C and B to B today. It's B to B to C. It's the back end pivoting the front end, front end pivoting the back end. Now, what it really means is um, today, if you look at it, right, um, uh, B to B has got issues on digitization. You know why? Because if I'm a B to B player, for you guys, you won't have. It because you won't have the plethora of systems. So for you, you are as good as B2C. But if I'm a large B2B player, I'll have a plethora of systems, right? As you know, he knows uh, CEO of Sunmar Group. He'll have a lot of systems. As a CEO, he will say, I want a report. He'll say, hey, I'm getting this from system one, system two, system two, three. I'm combining everything, ERP, SAP, you know, all those things, right? The digitization will not be complete. So you, in B2B, you will have the added responsibility of completing the digitization and taking it to digital. Are you getting the nuance? You know what, what I mean by digitization? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, good. So digitization is nothing but uh, any uh, efficiency driven system is digitization. So if I have to do um, uh, employee management system, right? That's digitization. If I want to do attendance, payroll management system, that's digitization. Anything that reduces cost is digitization. Anything that improves revenue is digital. Right? So you, you will see the, the front end systems are all digital systems, right? The back end systems are all digitization. 
right? So in a in an existing B two B setup, you will have multiple back end systems, right? And you will have a front end system, right? It has to connect to the back end system. That is what I call as B two B to C. And that is a new order today because if you look at B two B scenario, the true essence of digital is how do I connect it? How do I do the plumbing? Right? It's a very tough thing. It's not easy. Like I told, like I was telling the lead to code, we have to kind of sunset five systems to get to that system. Getting that one minute KPI, it was a one and a half year uh, project. It's not an <laughs> easy task, right? So it takes that amount of time to uh, do that. So I, I, I think, uh, uh, in the interest of time, <laughs> let me, I have not told it all. <laughs> but I think, uh, I, I hope broadly it gives the context, right? I think it gives the tone. So we, uh, the next one I wanted to cover was a mousetrap uh, fallacy, which is like oversimplification of marketing, right? And, and a lot of times I have seen, I have mentored a lot of startups and I have seen a lot of startups actually fail because they say I built a great product. It's an engineering driven startup, right? I built a great product. In fact, um, um, I just recently uh, met uh, one uh, really great technical person who I respect enormously and he spent two years in building a product and the market does not want the product, right? Unfortunately, that is the truth. And he was asking me, I don't know how to do marketing and sales. I need to hire a guy. I said, you need to be the sales and marketing guy. <laughs> yeah. You're getting the, you know, one tip for the, who is running the finishing school. Okay, one tip for you, which is, you know, startup founders who are very technical, I think you can coach them on how to build sales and marketing skills. Because there's no passion other than the founder who is selling. No? Because he was asking me, hey, can you get me a sales and marketing guy? I said, you should be the sales guy. Just go and try to sell, no? It's okay, it's fine. So I think that there's a there's a lot of things about uh, the engineering uh, and marketing, uh, you know, this thing, right? And this is also an issue, which is how do you refine the brand positioning, right? And a lot of times we have seen companies asking us, hey, you know what, give me a term that defines storytelling, right? To go about search. Give me a term that we need to unify. Okay, interconnected customer for life. Okay, that's great. Like we'll all rally around it, right? Or you know, you say, take a thesaurus and say nurturing, enchanting, or <laughs> you know, what is the brand purpose? What is the visual brand? See, you need. I think it's it's not a one size fits all, but it's about like does it does it align with your ethos? Like the Lorna Jane example I said about fitness, food, and does it align with the brand, right? Does it align with your B2B brand, right? How do you like lead to code or interconnect customer does, it, you know, are you fulfilling your promise? Because if you don't fulfill your promise offline, you are spoiling the credibility in no second, right? You're, nobody is going to really look at you seriously, right? It will it, be just a credibility issue immediately. So I think the key thing is, to your point, a B testing, which is like you create a story, you iterate the story, right? You keep changing the story, it's perfectly fine. Keep doing everything. Then keep it very simple. It need not be complex. And this I think is very hard. It's extremely hard. I mean I'm just <laughs> I, I I don't have uh, I mean, I have so many examples to say from customer workshops. Every customer wants to keep their uh, vision and the digital uh, footprint to be super complicated, right? It has to be very simple, very, very simple. What do you do? Or what does your brand do? Or what does your business do? It has to be very, very simple, right? If, if your grandmother can understand it, I think it's the perfect choice. Do A-B testing with the grandmoms. That will be better. <laughs> Like Steve Jobs says, right, what is a computer? A computer is a bicycle for the human mind. Right? If I have I, I use this example yeah, for a lot of uh, design thinking workshops, right? In a design thinking workshop, you actually the first question I ask is uh, to the youngsters is uh, can you explain a computer to your great great grandmother? Not grandmother, great great grandmother. 
how will you explain the numbers? Can you say monitor, CPU? And so like Steve Jobs said, Computer is a bicycle to the human mind. So they know bicycle, bicycle was there. They know what is the function of bicycle, they know human mind. Very simple statement. So the, the simplistic uh, nature is very important in digital markets. Now, I quickly move on, I have some more time. So, what is customer experience? As I said, this is a slide that I took it from Bill McDermott's speech recently in SAP. What is customer experience? Customer experience, as you can see, for an autom automotive company, there's nothing but the passenger on the bus being manufactured as our customer, not just the driver of the bike. So I have to cater to the passenger, not to the driver. Similarly, for a retailer, the customer experiences, the shopping experience starts in the parking space. Right? That is customer experience. So you can relate to your own business. Where does customer experience start? Right? It doesn't start at somebody actively looking at your product. It starts with somebody indirectly looking at your product. Right? That's well. So how do you kind of um, like appliances manufacturers? Classic example. How many of you have seen Facebook ads of Dyson? Dyson, D Y S O N. They they have the ad purifier. Right? What strikes you? What strikes you when you look at a Dyson product, the air purifier? No, that is feature. Because you are looking at the features. I'm saying first look when you look at the product, the design, right? The the simplicity, the it's a well designed product. Yeah. At the same time it's it's uh, very humanistic. Exactly. A minimalism, very humanist. So that is exactly this. Which is appliance manufacturing. We no longer sell appliances. We sell better taste. So if you have a Dyson, if you procuring Dyson, it means it shows you have better taste, right? That is how they think. It's not about like features alone. That is why great products come. Great products don't come because I want to increase sales. I want to show that you have better taste. It's a brilliant product, you should check it out. Dyson is a great B2B company and one of my all-time favorite companies, right? It's an excellent company. Trends driving customer experience. As I said, it's not B2B, it's, it's not B2C. It's B2B2C, which is, what is your single view of the customer? I'll have a warehouse management system. I'll have an inventory management system. I'll have a... Uh, CRM guy, I love a customer success guy, I love an operations manager, I love this guy, that guy in a B2B setup. But what is your single view of the customer? Do you have that? And but again, this I love I love this because this is a SAP's uh, you know slide, right? Customers for life. This is the storytelling we have done in many cases where we say it's interconnected customers for life. It's like you take it, you know, as a, as a concept. Then um, trusted data, I think with GDPR and things like that, how do you look at your customer data? And how do you look at uh, connecting your front and back office? These are the four trends. This, uh, we have been advocating from day one. We call it SOS, which is storytelling, omni-channel and sales. Um, storytelling. Uh, sorry, omni-channel is what channel you would want to operate upon. This as a founder and a CEO and a operations head or a, or a startup guy, you can decide today what channels you would want to operate. You don't need to operate in 100 channels. You just say, I will operate in Facebook today. We are small. It's okay. I had an HR uh, recruiter in my firm. Uh, she... Uh, moved on to become an HR person in another company and now she has started her own company. Uh, and uh, she is uh, creating uh, fashion products, not fashion fashion, but she is creating these products using organ uh, not organic, old uh, uh, ingredients, natural ingredients for hair oil and lipstick and things like that. Right? It's been one month, she's operation. She doesn't have a website. She doesn't have anything. It's only Facebook. 
and she has tremendous number of followers and i just spoke with her some time back she said the the sales is booming little because whatever she makes it's sold completely she just uses one channel unique channel today today later on as she scales i think she will expand to a website and the commerce side and so on and so on. so as a founder it's your decision to use what channel you would want to use and what channel your brand will gravitate to some like somebody told linkedin right some some brands will gravitate to linkedin some brands will gravitate to instagram some brands will gravitate to facebook but most importantly it's not about which brands gravitate to what channel it's about which channel you have the maximum number of followers that is the key because that's where you are going to influence right right suppose if you have the maximum number of followers in a particular channel you can influence that right that's why i, I credit that girl who is very young she just had massive number of followers in facebook and she just unidirectionally converts that into into a brand for herself right right so that's a great achievement so this this is again a culmination of our launch of 400 sites globally in digital and e-commerce so what we say is the sole experience we we say that as a brand you got to you got to attract right you got to first attract your target audience whether it's online or offline it doesn't matter you got to attract that's the first step so attract in b2b case would be a anonymous person who is looking at your brand or a person who has already interacted with you and who is in awareness state and who is going to buy right so attract has got multiple components in the digital component attract is nothing but a website what are the key metrics for attract can anybody tell traffic right that's the key metric for it how do you get traffic we will revisit that but you get traffic through scm and seo right so that's our attract assume b2b players here you have attracted enough uh, customers to your channel or website or whatever it is whatever channel here you choose a channel which channel you want to attract right you would you would just attract in facebook period or you would attract in a mobile app period you would attract in uber decided to attract only in app it's okay no it's one channel so you decide what channel you would like to attract them on right once you have decided the channel this according to us is the most underestimated piece right this is where you will lose your customers you have attracted great then how do you interact with them right what type of like for example you have say 1 million unique visitors coming to your site how do you interact with them you have the email ids you have the database you have everything right how do you interact with them do you have a blog do you do you update them every month do you tell them what is going on do you talk to them you what how do you interact with them it is effort it's a serious effort to interact with them that's why i'm repeatedly saying nike 25 million unique visitors it's a b2c example but still it's a as the brand grows it becomes much more difficult right as they say right the opportunity cost goes up when you are when you are a ceo of a company to start a company <laughs> because you are earning a lot of salary why do you want to leave that into so the opportunity cost goes up right as the brand goes up the opportunity The, the the effort to do it is very very high for you the effort will be low but you need to interact no assume that you have like say to your website you know that you are getting about 100000 visits every month what are you doing to those 100000 visitors that's a key question that you need to ask yourself right so that's it right is this is all very simplistically put because a lot of people give uh digital is a very big buzzword right so for us digital is this right it's like four pillars of digital trends you attract you interact the third is transact okay you have interacted with them this transact transact is conversion how do you convert anonymous users registered users 
whatever type of users who are interested in your product to buy your product. That's call to action. So that's transact. Do you have a transaction engine? Fine, that's an e-commerce site. Do you have a call center where somebody places the order? Fine, that's a call like this female. She has a call, uh, she has given her mobile number, dedicated mobile number, so people will call and order. Yeah, that's transact, that's call to action. So you need to have an engine completely. Then comes React, which is what I took, I alluded earlier, which is once somebody has transacted with you, then the fun starts. Are they happy? Are they thrilled? Are they irritated? Are they frustrated? Have you got a short one on them? You know, what are you going to do about it? React is super critical because we are inundated with choices. We are inundated with choices. So if you don't do a good job of React, you are just, you are losing that guy just like that. So React, um, we will take a separate session on it in the workshop, but React, keep this in mind. How do you, re how do you uh, react on customers who are in different categories? Or you should react to a customer who is thrilled with you on huh? buying your product. You should react to a customer who is not thrilled with you. Then there are different gradations. How do you kind of do that? Then this is this is a very visual representation for everybody's benefit on omni channel. We believe, we believe today that there are 14 channels, uh, 14 distinct channels. This is what is I told about the Rolex watch example. This is all offline, that's all online. So you can decide which channel you would want to play, but you need to have one book of record because you need a consistent brand experience. If you don't have one book of record, the call center guy will talk something random and your website will talk something very sophisticated manner. Right? So there is a there is a big disconnect between you know uh, brand experience. Right? So you need to have one book of record and you need to like take it. This is easier said than, said than done. It's a big challenge for brand, big brands not a big challenge for you guys, okay? But the challenge for you guys is, when you are starting with a channel, I would recommend you to have the roadmap, right? Which is, hey, I'm starting with this channel, I'll go to this channel, I'll go to the next channel, I'll go to the next channel, because you need to build your foundation keeping the journey in the channel, right? So you can't keep your foundation thinking that, hey, I just need to have website and done, because in five years, you will be massively successful, but you will inherit a monster which will not be agile, right? Which will never be able to adapt to the next league or level, right? This is an interesting concept we advocate. We call it as UBP, uh, which is nothing but unique buying proposition and not unique selling proposition. What does it really mean? Um, unique selling proposition is dead. Don't ever go and pitch to somebody that this is my USP. USP is there. It's UBP. This is what is what is a unique buying proposal? Why should somebody buy you? That's what you should think, right? Because the world is filled with choices. And why should somebody buy? You? It applies to every department. It, it applies to even uh, IITs. It applies to your solar business. It applies to Bond, it applies to everybody because the choices are there, it's plenty. USP was good 20 years back, but today it's UBP. Even if you take an Apple, yeah, there are multiple choices. MacBook Pro is great, uh, laptop, but yeah, there are, there are uh, multiple choices, right? Or a refrigerator or a, any equipment that you take. There are, there's nothing that says you just can't afford not to buy this. Right? So UBP, focus on what is your UBP. UBP is directly correlated to what? Customer experience. What do your customers want? What? This is our, if this slide dates back seven, dates seven years back. <laughs> we did this seven years back. We still use this because a lot of brands come to, come to us and say, hey, we are great. It's our USP. I mean, we, even B2B brands, they say, hey, we are great, we, are, it's a good, we, have, we have a history and meaning. I tell them only one small story, right? I said, 98, I used a Blackberry Perth. 
that's a reduce limiting beyond it's a great product it's an amazing product can anybody tell what is blackberry so you can't say i am a monopoly in the market and my dealers are just going to buy me absolutely not absolutely not never know tomorrow somebody else will come and take your market share the more uh, relevant to b2b industries that we are operating but for you guys you have to internalize what's your ubp because ubp ubp pervades everything because you, if you have your ubp right your own media will be right your if your own media is right you will get earned media if your own media is right you will have the right content on your digital platform so it all goes back to what i talked earlier makes sense i mean uh, are we aligned okay um, now i'll rush through because i think these are some of the things that you guys know i think this is on the channel uh, we talked about pay the own that earn i think all of you know about it i'll just quickly get everybody on the same page own earned media is the number of followers that you have on social channels paid media is what you pay to google and facebook to get people to look like you and own media is what you really own so as they clearly say paid our strangers own our customers own our fans right so you need more fans and more customers but keep a tab on strangers a lot of brands focus on this right very good thank you earned media no they don't purchase the product you might sorry earned uh, they don't purchase the product no they will indirectly because as fans they will become customers so that's where the it's a circular loop so fans become customers then they become fans so it's a circular loop here so whereas here it's no circular it's just one right here it's a circular loop yeah do they create any impact the paid one sorry do the paid one create an impact paid one a uh, paid one creates a lot of impact paid one actually uh, how do i say um, when you start something you got to pay right you got to really bring the uh, traffic up and things like that but over time you got to keep a tab on it because see lot of brands what they do they pay to google facebook everywhere and they will get the strangers thinking that they are customers yeah. okay but if you don't focus on these two you will only keep paying here as i told about the education institute right they were paying 3 million dollars to google but their own media and earn media were pretty low it's not like high so at some point you know this will go up and that will go down completely so your right right thing is you have to balance this by invest also investing in these two in parallel and then that all relates to the earlier concepts that you saw which is how do you attract how do you interact how do you kind of take care of the react fees and thing and what is your customer experience story what is the story you want to tell how do you engage things like that it's an it's, it's an iterative process you are, that's why i keep saying right you are looking at a five year road map and not like a quarterly uh, mechanism right a quarterly mechanism is good for here right so, okay i get 100000 visitors what is the conversion rate one person what is being a startup like can they invest on the paid sorry a startup so they can't invest on this paid you can absolutely you can absolutely you can and you like on a basic start like uh, let's take a uh, Like six months old as startup. Mm. So can they? Yes. Because it's being like no. Otherwise, it's very tough for uh, for your uh, customers to figure you out, right? Yes. So you have to invest. Like your basic investment starts with paid media, and then it goes to owned and earned media, complete, right? But you have to start with paid media. So let the people explore us. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. You have to do it. But what I'm trying to convey here is. um you will get some early success with paid media so you will get it to the illusion that that is enough that's where i think you got to draw the balance right so you when you pay you will get visitors there's no questions about it right but you have to re really invest on the other two uh, pillars 
to make sure that this is this is not sustainable over a long run. So you have to balance. And again, there is no right or wrong there. You know, there is no ratio. A lot of customers have asked me, what is the ratio? Is it one is to two is to one, two is to two? There is no ratio there. It's, it's all about looking at three, four metrics, which is traffic, conversion rate, average order value, you know, your KPIs. You have to merge multiple metrics to kind of uh, get that ratio. I would say it's a golden ratio. So, so, so since you already told me, uh, we are a social media marketing company. Yeah. So we primarily work with uh, small businesses. So what we advise them, or uh, we also talk about this content, brand building, and the storytelling about. It. But uh, in, in a country like India, where the digital literacy for people, you know, like, and compared to in South India, where we first started in Madurai. So it takes a long time for us to you know, like, educate the brand to actually. Uh, they focus more on the metrics. They they doesn't they, like if, the, if a post gets like uh, 200 likes, their brand is you know like wide wide reaching wide. So how do you like propose uh, since the brands that you've given example of uh, in, the, in the in the past one hour, they will be ready to invest a lot of money for the content building. For example, a brand like Nike would actually have like marketing budget to build a, build the content. But for a small business, when we try to educate them about like the brand building, or it's very hard for them to you know, like take into them. They only focus on sales. So, what would you say? Uh, so, I, I think like if we can give an idea of how uh, like a small thing that we can work on to educate the brand to give us, uh, you know, like uh, like I don't know how to say. So, <laughs> so. so we basically have this problem of. Uh, you know, uh, our customers usually say they only want sales and the digital presence is not very important. They're okay with going with a single channel. Maybe a company that's been there for 20 years and says, no, I want to go to channel, I do not want to work with multiple channels. My website is okay, this is enough. What is happening right now is enough. But they expect sales through the online, through the digital sphere also. But how to make them aware, like either through case studies or how do we bring them this awareness to these people also? Yeah, I think that's a different... Uh thread we need to take in the workshop. But I think my uh, sphere is we have worked with uh, some startup brands. We, I have a case study on Nico, which is India's indigenous logo. I think uh, we did not have a lot of funds. But the point I'm trying to make here is um, it goes back to awareness and education, right? Because at the end of the day, as I told earlier, right, uh, digital marketing to drive only sales, I mean, it's a futile exercise. I don't think so. It's going to really benefit you guys. It's neither it's going to benefit the brand, right? That you are, you guys are going to serve. So, so all you are going to get out of your uh, company is you will get paid for an activity. You are not going to get paid for an outcome, right? So it's going to take. Uh, so you have to segregate from. There are two aspects that I'm I'm sharing with you, right? One is your company. How do you serve them, right? Which is you have to take a call internally. Are you, what is your storytelling? Are you going to be in the game of activities or are you going to be in the game of outcome? And you have to choose your customers, right? Because, you know, you can't boil the ocean. You can't say, I'm going to, because you have only, it's, a, it's called the marginal utilization of your time, right? So if you are going to go to a brand like Subuna Chicken, who, He's not going to invest on online, right? You know, you, you can hit your head on. I mean, no. I just, I just took an example. Right? I know I'm getting video tape here, but uh, let me <laughs> remove that brand, right? I'm just saying some brand X, right? I mean, they say I'm doing quite well. I mean, so your strategy there would be yes, do quite well, pay for my activity. That's it, right? You just move on. See that. The content uh, piece on educating the customer has to be aligned with the boardroom and the CEO, right? Yeah, otherwise, they are not going to invest in a content. Content is a uh, founder and a CEO decision. Ultimately, we are talking, I mean, we are talking about, you are you're saying about SME market. I am talking about really top-notch educational institute that is not ready to invest in content. So your spectrum is wide here. <laughs> now the point here that I'm trying to make here is, at some point they will realize, because you know it's the opportunity cost. So if you're able to give a perspective of the opportunity cost, 
that would be great. See, that's what in India it happened, right? A lot of people started saying, you know, I know, I remember 10 years back, a lot of people said e-commerce in India is useless. Nobody is going to buy. Today, what happened? Right? Today, the footfall in malls are like decreasing and like people are buying. People are interestingly buying anything and everything. Right? And I'll give you one beautiful example. We met the president of Philips some time back and he said, he makes more than a billion dollars in Amazon store. Why does he want to build a website? Okay. It's a very startling revolution. Right? So it, it will change. The dynamics will change. So uh, my approach to you would be when you are looking at your story, what is your story? So you go back to the point that I made, right? What is your UBP? If your UBP is that customer segment, I think you will just take a long time to break even. You have to quickly come out of that customer segment base. And you need to look at, hey, how do I get customers who will at least respect some level of uh, content uh, view, right? Because without content, you are not going to survive in the, in the field. They can say, hey, I am ready to survive, right? But uh, good luck, right? <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to overtake at some point. So my view is, you have to kind of take a approach to your own strategy. What is your company's strategy towards your customer? Right? Like we have that very regularly. So the scale changes. That's all I'm trying to say, right? I mean, we we have customers who, who say most is for the least is. Right? The scale only varies. That's it. But if you look at it at a percentage basis, it's the same. So we have to take a call. No, we also have to take a call. I don't want to work with you. Right? Great. You tell in a very polite way and move on. That's it. But conceptually, you can't ignore it. That's the point I'm trying to make. So for a startup that's now say cash positive, is there a typical uh, percentage figure that we have to, it is good to pump into digital marketing? For so, this effort. so there is no uh, particular benchmark by industry or by uh, this thing, uh, the benchmark is completely act activity and outcome driven, completely. So you do a certain set of activities, you iterate it and you look at the outcome. So it's it's complete iteration driven, right? So a lot of uh, brands actually keep a budget, they increase a the budget, they look at what is the outcome they get, they increase again, if the outcome is very good, they increase it furthermore. So there is nothing called, okay, I fix a budget and then, because it's completely directly proportional to the sales. So you can't fix a budget then, right? So it's... No, not budget, uh, a, a percentage. So percentage of the revenue every month, cash positive is funded in... So a good uh, percentage, uh, I, I, I would say 5 to 10 percent is a good uh, starting point. But again, don't take me for uh, granted. I would say we have to look at the metrics. So, I mean, you, maybe you could give me some more data, I can give you uh, some perspective. So if you give me the metrics of, when you say cash positive, you give me some metrics on what is your current traffic on your site, what is your average order value, what is your conversion rate, what's your baseline metrics, you know, I can actually give you a good comment. Because the percentage thing uh, works on the KPI level. So for example, if I'm spending on a website, then the percentage is, hey, I want to get 10% of my offline revenue online. That's a good uh, baseline to start. But on digital marketing, it, uh, it completely varies. Because a lot of times what happens is in two quarters, you will actually see substantial value. And you want to add more. Or maybe in one quarter, you won't see value in a channel. So you would want to reduce more. So it's, you get the idea, right? It's, it's not a, this one. But we can look at the metrics exactly. For a product-based uh, startup company, uh, when is the right time to invest into digital media? Like, uh, it can be like paid or uh, whatever. See, uh, I think, uh, so the, for a product-based company, as you are going to be in the market, right? You are, you are in the market. 
and you are selling. So then this is the time. So is it is it like before production? You have to be in the market. So you so for a product based company, two quarters before launching, you can start your uh, footprint activities, right? By saying, hey, we are coming soon. It's in the stealth mode. You can build up the curiosity online. A lot of brands have done that, small time brands, right? You can build up the curiosity online. You will have a followers, set of followers who will be following. Then it would be a prime time to invest in the market. To launch the site. But you've got to start building that. And for a product company also, blogs is a very important aspect of how you want to kind of uh, take it forward, right? That's an element of content. Which is how do you want to write uh, relevant blogs to engage the user base. Hi. So, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, at Expo, let's say we're going to Expo. Uh -huh. So, what, what would be like the uh, most effective tool that we can use to uh, market ourselves? Expose the effective tool is, um, I think it's a combination of three things. So you have a sort of a uh, standing screen, right? You know, like a standy, not the printed standy. Right, yeah. So the printed standy will be there. But you will have a screen, right? You know, you can, you can get a, you know, this costs nothing, literally. So you will have a 32 inch TV or a sort of a standy TV. And you play your stuff. So when people are going in an expo, they look at it, okay. If you play your stuff, you just don't need to play the clutter. Don't play the clutter. Don't play a brochure or anything. Just play two or three things. That's it. Just needs to capture the attention. That's it. And it can be even anti-brand. Focus on anti-brand because there's a lot of clutter. Right? So you have to kind of come out of the clutter. Your, in your framework, there was something called uh, interact with the customer, right? right? So I think, uh, so where is the benchmark? Like, where is the line? Because sometimes with the brands, you know, in terms of emailing, they call us spam. You know, like big brands, they love us all spammers. So you think that's going to be a good thing or a bad thing? Too? So uh, the decision on email is not yet out. <laughs> okay. let's, let's be clear. Okay. The decision on email or the jury on email is not yet out. Which means email marketing still remains a very good campaign. Okay. Very good campaign. I don't know whether you know, statistically in India, many Indians have been duped on phishing. You know or you don't know. <laughs> many, you know, the, you guys know the story, right? Many Indians have been duped, right? Uh, so it, email marketing works. <laughs> it still works. But I'm saying jokes apart, I think. Uh, uh, there are tools by IBM or there are open source tools which actually monitor campaign automation. And there are pretty good success rates on email marketing. It's just that again it goes back to content in email marketing, right? So if you create an email marketing which is only copy, uh, invariably people will delete it, right? So you have to put a mix of a good image of the product or good something, you know, again, see, the key is UBP. How do you kind of come out of the club? That requires some thinking actually. Why only you? It can't be thought by anybody. A lot of pe times people think that, okay, let me outsource this to an advertising agency. Okay, I can give some yarn. Right? But what's the you? You are the person. No? You know what this, what made you start this. So you will have to crystallize that into one simple thing. Right? Because that is the key. Uh, and in B2B, so when you when you keep creating a database, let's say you are sending out an email campaign, you launch a new product. So how do you like, where do you, do you buy the data or do you like buy the data? You buy the data. So there are lot of lead sources. I can give you a list. Okay. There are tremendous amount of lead sources. Okay. How much do they cost? Uh, it depends what regions, right? So uh, you want India, you want Southeast Asia. It depends, right? So the filter is on multiple categories, right? So the filter is. We want uh, US North America database. We want uh, Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia, again, it varies by, by industry, by category. We want only automotive database. We want India-based database. So there are, you, you, need to, you need to come up with a menu, what you want. And based on that, there are providers. There are good providers, there are bad providers. 
So you need to kind of understand which is the right one. I can I can uh, yeah, give you a little bit. But you need to tell me what is the space that you want the territory and things. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think uh, we are running short of time. If you have the energy. <laughs> no, no, but what about them? <laughs> I'm worried about them too. <laughs> they won't get this opportunity again. Okay. So I'll quickly go through. So uh, this is actually by Google. It's actually a purchase funnel by Google. What they Google says, and this is what pretty much everybody has used it as a benchmark. It's basically from awareness to loyalty. Now, why does it matter? It matters because. Uh, you know, product company, you got to do awareness. Companies which are in whatever point B, you got to do action. And then, of course, loyalty, right? So, you got to look at varied scales. And at each and varied scales, you look at what type of engagement you would want to do, right? Awareness, your engagement will be very different. Action, your engagement will be very different, right? Because action, you will do promotion, you will do cross selling. You will entice because the person is already in the kitchen, right? So your your content for awareness is very different from content for action, and different options are that way. Right? So this is where the channels will come into play. What channels you identify? How do you measure? How do you optimize and iterate, right? So you can at awareness you can look at multiple aspects, right? You can look at SEO. You can look at affiliate. You can look at social, you can look at blog, you can look at referral campaigns, you can look at multiple aspects at an awareness level for you, right? When you are launching a brand, I think you can, there are multiple aspects on awareness. But when you look at consideration, you look at display ads, right? You look, when somebody is gone beyond awareness, you look at display ads. When you look at nurturing, you look at email and remarketing campaigns. And when you look at uh, purchase, you look at like cafe automation and things like that. This is again a different view of the same slide, so which gives a pretty interesting view. Awareness, SEO, social display, blogs, consideration, search SEO, preference, website for convert, purchase and social media. Now the point is, if your brand is going to move from awareness to loyalty, you got to create your digital asset in accordance with that, right? Because I've seen a lot of brands who say, yeah, yeah, I, I'll come, I mean, I'll have convert purchase, but for now, let me only spend for these three areas. Then, you know, you will not have a customer to buy, right? Like, there won't be any channel. Facebook is not a channel to buy, I mean, for all. <laughs> okay, it's not, a, I mean, we have to be careful about it, right? You know, are you looking at, uh, the, the entire uh, spectrum or are you looking at only two or three aspects of the spectrum? And you can incrementally decide how do you want to take that forward, right? Um, so this gives that perspective. Then I think um, this is for people who have uh, not used SEO uh, before. I think it's, it's a combination of multiple aspects, but most importantly as people in India say SEO is all about keywords. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, yeah. So I think uh, my view here is again anti, which is uh, uh, in SEO. You got to look at what is the more. Okay, let me ask a quick question here, right? For somebody who has implemented SEO and was who's seeing it for the first time, right? Somebody who's seeing it for the first time can figure out my can get my answer, right? What is the most important activity in this? Huh? No, no, it's an it's a it's an activity, but I'm saying what is the most critical activity? Copywriting. Who said that? Yeah. Copywriting and linking. Because that actually is the most important activity, which many many startups fail. Because you underestimate, right? You just think that you write any copy and people are going to look at it, right? Copywriting and link building is very critical, right? If your copy is not good, you might have the best keywords. 
but it doesn't really matter, right? Because copy is very, very critical. You need to have the right copy to kind of like do the link building. Of course, everything is important. I'm just saying a lot of times people underestimate those aspects to kind of like, you know. Is uh, it continuous refreshment important? Yes. Because if you have stack, very good copy, but it is static, you will drop. This will drop. Ranking report will drop. Google rank will drop you yeah. completely. So then you will invest a lot in keywords, but your rank will go. Refreshing yes. copy. Yes. Refreshing copy is very critical. Original copy, right? Again, the Google will identify clearly. Are you doing any cut copy base? <laughs> Original copy is very critical. So copy, that's where again if you go back, it's all interdependent. I keep on retrading. Again, it goes back to storytelling. What is your UBP? What's your customer experience? So it all adds up, right? If you don't have that uh, view, it becomes very tough to kind of build this up, right? Then comes paid media channels, which is all about your AdWords, your, you know, what, what message you want to do. It's very simple. It's basically, you know, paying money and getting your traffic. I think I don't want to elaborate on this, but uh, it's essentially you pay to, I mean, Google. Google is where Google is today because of just this. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's uh, interesting. Social media, I think, um, I mean, I've given a clutter here. I think the clutter has increased also now. Um, and uh, uh, I kept on saying, right, be selective in your choice of channels. You need not be. You need not be in all channels. You can be in one channel, two, right? So it's, I'm just, both statements are possible. But just be, whatever channel you select, the key message is go deep. Don't say, okay, I'm on Facebook and I'll post once a week. If you're on Facebook, you should post 200 times a day. <laughs> you have the content for it, right? Go deep, right? Are you engaging? Go, you know, what is the type of post you're doing? Are you uh, text, uh, is it a copy, is it a video? You have to really select the channel and really go deep. Right, that's the key. Um, email marketing and automation, I think we, we spoke about it. There are enough tools. Don't do it in a manual way. Just automate it. There are very simple tools to automate email marketing. I'm, I'm sure many of you would have heard about MailChimp and things like that. You can automate Or if you want to be super sophisticated, you can use a prototype of IBM Watson. I mean, IIT Incubation Cell can get a license for uh, IBM Watson. IBM Watson has got a campaign automation tool which is very sophisticated or email automation. So you can uh, plan on that. Um, content, we spoke about it. Um, yeah. So before, uh, we have like, uh, like a fixed set of channels for advertising. So nowadays, since we are all digital, we get sat ads everywhere. So do you see a saturation point in where people are starting to retarget? So other day, the, I was looking for a content writer for my uh, company. So I, my family was talking about like, content writing for like, quite a time. And my brother opens up the phone and we see an ad for a content writer in, in, from the website. And uh, the brand value that I had for that company like, like went down. So do you see a point that we are uh, reaching a point that there is a saturation in the online ads that we consume on a daily basis? Uh, yes and no. I think, uh, I would say yes and no, right? Because see, at the end of the day, I mean, we are social animals, right? We need to be reached out, right? You know, you can't say that uh, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to select everything on my own. Right? I don't think so, we have the do-it-yourself culture. Right? So we need that pampering, we need somebody to ask us, we need somebody to come to us, we need like even like our even our car service could be automated. But we wait for that person to call us. No? Right? You look at your own example, right? So I feel that I think uh, the clutter of ads will, uh, will saturate. That's why I said yes and no, right? Like if you have the clutter of ads coming in, that will saturate. But you know, the, the unique ads will, will be there, right? There's no questions about it. Unique ads will be there. Like for example, I'm, I'm amazed by 
I mean, whatever people say about Facebook, I'm amazed because if I Google purified ad, right, I get retargeted on Facebook with a product. I like it. It's okay. Because how do I know about new products? And somebody tell me how do I? Because I don't spend time, uh, you know, exploring new products. You're getting more. So I think that there is a benefit there, but again, too much of the same thing can get cluttered, right? You know. So the customers know what to take and what to ignore. So it's okay. It's like email campaign. So sometimes when you don't want to buy something and you just want to Google search something. No. But you, for example, the other day I was searching for 7 into something. No. So I get targeted with an ad for on 7 into because it is the same keyword. It but I don't need to buy a... Yeah. No, no, it will happen. There is no... That's what I am saying. There is enough success of customers who have clicked that. <laughs> that's what I am trying to say. There is, so it's yes and no. There are a set of customers who click that and go for it completely. So it's a, in the, again, it's like email. Somebody asked me about camp, email campaigns, right? The jury is not out. So there will be marketing people who will spend. Maybe Look, yes, because I'm in the marketing field. I am considering these as being targeted to me. And uh, layman who is not actually considered about this, I think it's money. Yeah. I think it's better we take this offline. Yeah, correct. Uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I just thought that I mentioned this for the benefit of the startup. That MailChimp up to number in 200 or 250 whatever no, no. is free. Right. So even if you are sending it out to 500 customers, send it out in two blocks of 200 each or 250 each, and it can go free. And you will get the analysis and the analytics to go free. It's not that for a small number you have to pay. So you <coughs> except that if you try going above that in a single campaign, then obviously there is some money, but you can. Break up the same message into three groups of 250 each. If 250 is the number, I don't remember exactly. Whether it's 200 or 250. 2000. 2000. 2000. No, I don't. 2000. Okay, what is the number? 2000. Yeah. Yeah, but there are upgrade options on MailChimp too, right? Yeah. No, I'm just saying free because I they think that it does. Paid for Correct. right from a uh, small number. Correct. Because particularly the B2B guys right. uh, to start with will not have that many people to send mails right. to which they want to analyze. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. I hope it was helpful. <laughs> okay, so we are looking at uh, the next one which is the wiki which is content marketing and creator. So again it's a reiteration, user generated content, what you get in social media, video content, um, which is important, blog, email marketing and influencer mentions. Yes. yes. So uh, I think the key takeaway is you are what you publish online. Right? So it's it doesn't really matter what channels you use, you are what you publish online. So uh, it, it takes a lot of time to really focus on one channel. Like for example, I am very particular that I only focus on two channels, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn. Because otherwise I will become mad. There is Twitter, then there is Instagram, then there is uh, uh, you know, YouTube and all. So I converge everything to LinkedIn and Facebook. So it's, it's easy because I have gone deep. So the the uh, content is very clear, right? You know, from that perspective. So you need to be clear. Uh, you know, you are what you publish uh, online, right? So uh, this is very interesting because this is called the rings of content, right? So don't think about you in content, right? Think about your customer or think about the user, right? So this is actually. Uh, a snapshot that we did for Nico. Nico is an, I mean, we did some consulting uh, stuff with Nico. Nico is nothing but India's indigenous robot. I don't know whether you guys have heard about it. It retails in Flipkart for, I think, 20,000 rupees. Um, there are companion robots in the world. Um, the world's number one companion robot is Ibo. 
and uh, there are some other competitive uh, robots. So companion robots are effectively becoming more and more popular in the world, uh, especially for both men and women who don't like each other. <laughs> <laughs> and for kids who would want a companion to talk or uh, to get uh, some interesting updates and things like that. So I'm very proud of Miko because it's an Indian, India's indigenous robot. So how do you kind of create content rings, right? So this is a very live case, right? So you look at raising a robot, which is a review from a YouTube influencer. You look at what is Miko Robo, <coughs> brains and personality, and you look at Meet Miko, which is paid video news. Right? This is the inner circle, which is really hardcore content about Miko. This is the inner circle. So the first inner circle is Miko itself. Then this is the second circle. The third circle of uh, content is interview with pediatricians and robotic experts. Right? So you publish that content. Video snippets of making of Miko. Team behind Miko and manufacturing unit. Video Miko for features, uh, product features, and interviews of kids and mothers who are using Miko. So this is the second circle. Now you go to the next circle, right? Which is a guide to managing kids' anxiety and stress, right? Or would you want Robo to be your child's best friend? Or fun and math games with kids and robots and share your kids IQ level or Miko play one. So this is all about the concentric circles coming towards Miko, right? So this is how you develop the content, right? So how do you build your content in terms of the whole thing, right? So it's not about, okay, I have Miko, I'll just talk about Miko, guys will come and buy Miko, come on. Doesn't work out, right? Doesn't work out. So you need to build that engagement with the with the influencers, with the people who matter, and kind of converge that to the product. So in a sense, it's also storytelling, but it's more centered around content. So it's a very live example of, uh, of, a, of a particular content uh, segregation. Any questions on this? In fact, I have a separate deck on Eco. It's, it runs in uh, 200 slides. I, I don't so I can cover today, but <laughs> I think this effort is good. Right? So uh, again, there are multiple channels of uh, marketing. So I think the key here is all of it are in, interconnected, right? So I think unconventional PR is very critical for all B two B companies because see, you might uh, you might have an advisor, you know, who is. Uh, who is looking at uh, building a product, or you might have a mentor who is building a product. He can do unconventional PR, right? But that's a building block of your channel, right? That's not, you cannot ignore that, right? So things like, you don't need to have a newspaper ad to kind of do it, right? It's, it's all indirect and direct uh, PR that you are building. That. Similarly, you know, we spoke about all the other concepts, the social, you know, ICM, content marketing, and so the way you do it is, um, you actually create a bridge. We call it as a bridge, right? So the bridge is like this, right? So you say, this is SEO, this is SEM, this is email, this is blog, this is influencer, PR, and some more, right? Now what does it really mean is, this is a traffic, right? So the SEO will bring the traffic to maybe 100,000. SEM will bring the traffic to 200,000. So you actually create a bridge. You don't do anything in a siloed manner. Then you add it up and you see, you iterate, you are asking, right, about how much money you need to spend. You iterate accordingly, right? You know what happens in the bridge, right? So you look at it every week. You know, hey, is my SEO giving results? Great. Okay, if it's not giving results, maybe you change the keywords. Okay, it's not giving results, maybe you change the copy. Right, is the SEM giving results? Okay, maybe you do this. So it's like a bridge file that you keep it as a live file, a dynamic file. This is where actually 
This is where every digital marketing fails. This is where the rubber meets the road. Whatever you do, this is where the rubber meets. You have to sit every week, look at the metrics at each and every channel, and actually be very, very objective. Not subjective, very objective about what is your traffic, what's your conversion rate, what is your page visits, what's your... Uh, you have to look at all the metrics and kind of be very clear that, okay, this that this cause, this is the cause, this is the effect. This is the cause, this is the effect. So you should be able to kind of come up with the cause and effect measures. So, in summary, it's a true blue digital marketer's approach, which is you create a campaign that is you want to grow by this percentage. You do the testing, you do the optimize, you do the analysis. You kind of change again the navigation, right? So it's a circular loop on a weekly basis not even a monthly basis. You kind of keep doing it on a weekly basis to a level where you just become, you just know intuitively, okay, you know, I think uh, this content actually gave me a lot of followers. This blog post that I wrote kind of got me this level of followers, right? So a lot of brands do that very well. When I say brands, not big brands. I'm saying very small brands do that very well because I'm telling you again and again, a big brand this is a massive issue for a big brand getting this dashboard actually takes, I, Hari knows this, right? Because Hari creates this dashboard for big brands uh, for us. Getting this will take about two weeks. We have to get metrics from Google Analytics. We have to get metrics from order, uh, order management uh, platform of the e-commerce platform. You know, it's, it's, it's a pain. Then you have to connect the dots and you have to get that. But for a starter, this is very easy. You can get it just like that. Your advanced Google Analytics will give you this and you will you will be able to converge this and you can see this. But you have to see this. If you don't see it, you will never iterate what? Why do you need to see this? Can somebody tell me? To get the ROI. Wrong answer. To know whether the market is Exactly, but going back to my four key takeaways, you will know what is your story, you will know what is your customer experience, whether it's sticking or not, and you know what to, what to change in your story, and you know what to change in your customer experience. So it's not ROI. <laughs> you have to keep iterating because your storytelling, you think it's a story, but customers don't think it's a story, right? Your ROI will tell it if your story is good or bad. Right? Need not be. You can have a good ROI but a bad story and it will be short. I can give you a hundred examples. One example please. I mean, good example would be Flipkart. I mean, there are hundreds of them. I, I have enough sales, they, but there is no story, right? What is the story? Right? Recollection with the brand is very hard. Huh? Recollection with the brand is very hard. No, I, I think, see, the, the idea is it has to be aligned with your ethos, right? What are you intrinsically upon? It's like this, right? A priest who is not a good priest, and if he gives lectures, at some point he'll get caught, right? He might have 2,000 followers, but at some point he's off, no, he's gone. He's up to like ash, sorry, he's in jail, right? So that is the analogy that you have to take, right? ROI will come, that's great, but what is your, are you aligned to your customer experience and story? If you don't have it, I think it, you will just, it's just a patch. I mean, it will come and bind you at some point, right? So, yeah, I think uh, that's, I think I covered a lot of customer uh, experiences. I think uh, this is all I have for today. <laughs> I took half an hour extra. Do you have any other questions? And I have a detailed slide on Eco which I'll cover in the workshop. But I think in, in general, what are the analytics actually companies ask you when they are giving a So there are, uh, I mean, uh, I can share that with you. So there are multiple uh, 
there are multiple metrics, right? So there are metrics for anonymized users, there are metrics for registered users, there are met there are generic metrics like you know traffic, conversion rate, order value, average order value, you know, page visits by the particular page, page visits on that particular content, uh, you know, conversion by that particular category, conversion by this particular category, how many which company uh, loads what page. So there are like hundreds of metrics, but don't worry about it. See, the three key metrics that you should worry about are traffic, conversion rate, and average order value. That's it. The only three key metrics. Nothing else matters. The installer, I mean, it's a noise. It's traffic, average order value, conversion rate. If you don't have these three, I mean, yeah, you can say my pay use it on like you know L2, L3 page was awesome, right? Yeah, I mean, great, but what is what does it translate? Is there a channel through which you can see consumer feedback and product development stage? There are a lot of channels. I think uh, Y Combinator is a good channel. Uh, huh? Which channel? Yeah, Kickstarters is a good channel. Uh, there are a lot of channels and there are, uh, so what is happening today is uh, a lot of product companies are using, creating their own channels. <coughs> like for example, what they do is they create the idea, they prototype it and they don't build the product. They prototype it and they test it with 100 prospective customers to validate the, uh, the, the prototype. What is that called? Kickstarter. Kickstarter, yeah. But Kickstarter works only in a consumer product. Yeah. Not B2B, yeah. No, I'm saying creating their own no, Kickstarter. Yeah, Kickstarter is consumer, but I'm saying a lot of B2B brands create their own channel, right? They create, uh, what they do is, like for example, they create the prototype. So the prototype will be nothing but your navigation flow, your UI, UI UX flow, and you know, your uh, the way uh, the customer experience will be handled, right, on B2B. That prototype, you take it to at least 100 prospective or existing new customers. In fact, we did that for one uh, client of ours, right? So we did the navigation flow, we did the prototype, and we created kiosks, like separate kiosks where the customer took a, uh, like we loaded it on the tablet, and like there were five tablets, and we got about 10 or 15 users every day. To kind of like you know, so they are not customers; they are all prospective users. And then there is a clear feedback form, which is again very simple. Five questions. That's it. So you, you get very clear feedback in terms of what you want. So, but uh, broader uh, tools, I think, like you know, there are some more like in starter. No survey monkeys for the survey, right? I'm talking. On the product level, there are some more, I'll get back to you. There are some more which uh, which kind of uh, takes you not just at prototype, it takes you at idea, prototype, and the next level. Yeah, that's what you Yeah, I, I mean, I'll get back to you. So, the same thing, what you said. So, it's a quiet study, right? What you said is. Which one? Uh, building up a prototype and then going back to uh, like individual customer. Right. So what they're supposed to have the awareness of exactly what it, the product is. So coming to our perspective, they no, no 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 they they will not have awareness right. They will so the way the prototype was addressed is that's a new product that you are building mm -hmm. and they are they are just exposed to the navigation without giving any awareness. Because the navigation, yes, because the navigation will determine whether the product will be successful or not, right? Because the navigation has to be simple and intuitive, right? If you clutter your navigation, the prototype will be a failure. See, that is where the investment in uh, UX is very critical, not UI, UX, right? What's your navigation? And again, navigation has got, I mean, I'm getting into a different territory, which is UI, UX. But navigation has got a clear concept, right? The concept is very simple, right? So if you're a B2B product, right? Or a B2C product, or let's say B2B, 
you will have something called user personas. User personas are your target segment. Right? What is your target segment for the new product that you are building? So you will, on an average, you will have five user personas. Okay. Then on the five user personas, each user persona will have multiple user journeys and edge case user journeys. You take those multiple user journeys and edge case user journeys and create a UX flow. That UX flow you create it in a way where it's very simple and a flow. Right? That is what the, the, the customers will test. It. Now, when the customers look at it and if they don't understand the flow, you have failed here. Go back to user person. Uh, recently, I've been reading a lot about uh, brand advocacy. So, in the digital sphere has been happening a lot. So it says that the uh, behavior of consumer has completely changed in the purchase area. The funnel that you show has extended more. It's, come, it's become a reverse funnel from the end after the purchase. Once uh, customer buys the product and is happy with the product, he starts to advocate about the brand. And people are, it itself becomes a kind of advertisement for brand. Is that really true? It is, uh, it is true. It is definitely true. So, uh, uh, if you take Singapore Airlines, right, there are a lot of brand advocates for Singapore Airlines, right? If you take Dyson, which is a B2B brand, there are a lot of brand advocates for Dyson, right? So, advocacy, uh, brand advocates are very high uh, for brands, right? I can quote in B2C, Under Armour has got an army of advocates. There are people, fanatics who won't use Nike at all. They will only use Under Armour, right? So they are all strong advocates, right? Or Apple is a great example, right? You know, you once an Apple user, you will never touch any other machine. You will never touch. You will stand in line to buy a premium product. See, that's where unique and differentiated come into play, right? Advocacy is, uh, it takes time to build, but once you have built it, I think it's very strong, right? But the journey of building advocacy takes time, right? It, it's not easy, right? In B2B brands, you will see automotive companies have got advocacy, right? Toyota has built tremendous advocacy. Uh, Honda has built tremendous advocacy in India, right? You will have Honda fans in India, right? They won't use anything other than a Honda, right? Tremendous advocacy, right? They, they won't touch anything. So uh, it's very, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's very prevalent. But uh, to build advocacy and uh, layer it with loyalty takes time. So awareness, consideration, advocacy, loyalty. Advocacy and comes in between. Yeah, advocacy, loyalty becomes, it takes more time, right? I can be an advocate, but I can also switch, right? So loyal means I'll never switch, but it takes time, you have to invest. Now, I'll also give you an example. On advocacy, the content again becomes very critical, right? So, I'm a platinum member in Singapore Airlines. I get emails. So, I'm an advocate of Singapore. But I get emails that says, what is Singapore Airlines? So, the content is awareness content, which is given to a platinum customer who is an advocate. That's where there is a problem. So that's why I'm repeatedly saying I'm using big company examples to give you a perspective that it is very easy for you to do. Right? As you grow bigger, it's very tough. Right? You know, I'm just giving you a perspective. I just get emails today that says what is Singapore Airlines. But I'm a gold, uh, I mean, gold, gold plus member of Singapore. So that's why the advocacy fails on content. So the email marketing is targeting as a, me as an awareness customer. So I get pissed off no, when I look at the email. When I look at the email. Uh, what do you think would be the reason for this? If I were the marketing person for Singapore Airlines, I would have like clearly maintained. I would know where my customer is on the funnel, and I'll be targeting them the right content. Oh yeah, I think you are looking at it very idealistically. Boss, it's very tough. I'm telling you, as you grow. You will have your contact database in one system. You will have your experience database in one system. You will have your loyalty 
database and another system. It is not easy. It is not easy because you have built all these and it's working. No? You have to stitch it together. I told you before. You have to connect front office to the back office. It's a very easy statement. It's very complex to do it. It's very complex. It's not easy. So it takes a lot of energy, time, investments to do it. Right. So that's why I'm saying these are conceptual things that when you start young, I think it's easy to build it up. But when you grow higher, it's very tough. So when you are now, you can easily like, he can separate a contact database and the experience database just like that in Excel. He can do that. He doesn't need me to worry, right? But big, bigger brands, it's very tough because it's stored in multiple systems. Very tough. You think big data? It's okay, but <coughs> it's tough.